um, uh, for addressing disparities, etc., uh, but not necessarily the solutions. Data can enable greater awareness of health uh, resources and government services, uh, but only if those willing to disseminate it uh, to, through their networks have better access to it. Uh, and then also that uh, the government in general has treasure troves of data, uh, and that agencies are more and more increasingly uh, working to liberate that data. So uh, the one missing key element that we that we haven't heard about today as much uh, is the fact that you know, government needs partners to do this. So even though we're all committed to getting this data out there and, and, uh, and we're working towards that, our agency has made a concerted effort recently, uh, and uh, the state of New York, as you saw, has, has done some amazing things as well. There's many municipalities that have worked on this, including the city of Chicago. You're going to see a great project that they're part of, the Chicago Health Atlas. Um, but we're not too naive to think that, that we can just do it all on our own. Simply just putting the data out there is going to be enough. Uh, we know that it's going to take uh, working with all the different stakeholders and partners that are out there. So I'm going to do a little activity here so you guys, uh, everyone here can see you have some kind of a, a role here to play. Uh, just raise your hand and uh, you can put it down on your desk. Just raise your hand if you're a part of a government agency at any level. Okay. Good. We want to encourage government to continue to do this. Uh, a not-for-profit, a CDO, or a foundation, or a trust. Uh, a healthcare provider or an insurer. That's helpful. Uh, an advocacy or a policy organization. Uh, private sector entrepreneurship. Uh, type of Good. Academia, researcher, innovator. Uh, have ever received a healthcare service? <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, is a human being. <laughs> so uh, it, this basically shows that you all have uh, skin in the game, right? And, and there's a there's a role for you to play. It's it's not that we can figure out that role as always. Sometimes unlocking our data uh, can help you decide what your role is too. So so sometimes we don't know the problems that you can help us solve until we make the data available. Um, the panel that we have with us today is is an amazing. Uh, representation of the different stakeholders that are, are increasingly wanting to partner with government to help us liberate our data and to put it to good use. Uh, so they're also going to hopefully, uh, uh, you know, with my prodding, uh, uh, talk about why they're working together for this cause, um, maybe even share some successful examples uh, in, in, uh, of some of these uh, collaborative partnerships. So um, if I if I may, can you join me here on the table? I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to go quickly through their, their bios. It's pretty extensive, but um, I want to give them uh, For one thing, we have a, a great advocate here from uh, the CEO of Stewards of Change, uh, Daniel Stein, all the way at the far, uh, my right, your left. Uh, he brings more than 22 years of experience working in business and consulting in public, private, and nonprofit human service organizations, focused on expanding operational capacity, solving internal and interagency problems, and improving client outcomes. Uh, he's worked across the country in California, New York, Washington, D.C., Louisiana, Connecticut, New Jersey, just to name a few. Uh, prior to forming the Stewards of Change, uh, Daniel started True Insight Marketing, a consultancy dedicated to applying business and marketing practices to child welfare, child welfare organizations. Previously, he spent 10 years at Kraft Foods and holds an MBA from Yale School of Management and a BA from Evergreen State College. Uh, next, we have Mark Harris, uh, who is the president and CEO of the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition, who has a presence right here in 1871 and has been a fantastic partner of the state of Illinois. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that drives public private partnerships to increase research and technology-based investment, talent, awareness, and job growth in Illinois. He has more than a decade of experience working in government, economic development, and higher education. This includes serving as the Deputy Chief of Staff to Illinois Governor Pat Quinn. Uh, he was working as Associate Director for the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago Food School of Business, and uh, spent four years in senior positions at the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And he holds a BS from the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign 
and a, a MA from the University of Chicago. Uh, next we have Dominique. I love how they lined up in the order I have there. Uh, <laughs> Dominique Cahoot? Uh, yes. Yes. That works. All right. Dominique Cahoot is the Director of Innovation and Networks at the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Uh, prior to joining the foundation, Cahoot held several positions in product development and commercial strategy at Genentech uh, in San Francisco, California. Most recently serving as International Payer Strategy Leader, focusing on the oncology portfolio. He's earned an MBA in finance from Columbia Business School in New York and a BS in cellular molecular biology from the University of Michigan. And last but not least, we have Matt uh, Waller. Uh, Matt is a behavioral scientist who works at the intersection of technology and human behavior. Isn't that cool, right? Uh, after two successful startups, he joined Microsoft and created the Bing for Schools program, which works to promote digital literacy through a combination of hardware, teaching, and environment in schools. Uh, proponent of dual process theory, Waller is a passionate advocate for a methodical approach to behavior change using technology. This is an area that government often fails at, right? How to change behavior and how to connect to our constituents. In his spare time, he advises startups and creates socially focused side projects like GetRaise.com, a free service that helps women ask for and get pay raises to help close the gender wage gap. So please join me welcoming our esteemed colleague. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Thanks for having us. Um, I know you're coming in from Seattle. You're coming from Kansas City. Kansas City, right here from Chicago, so from Chicago, <laughs> New York, and New York, outstanding. So we've got pretty much coast to coast uh, on this panel. Um, the, the first thing I want to start with is why, why is it that all of your organizations, you know, you have an advocacy perspective, you have uh, a catalyzing organization that, that works on the intersection between private and public sector, uh, you have a foundation that's obviously interested in this area, and then a private sector representation. Uh, why is it that each of you, um, you know, feel such a, uh, an interest in, in working together with government, and, and why is it that so important to open up uh, our, our data to, to the public and to organizations. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Daniel. Uh, is, there, is there really an appetite to, uh, to get at this data? Um, you know, do you have a great example of what change can come from in these data made available? Yeah, so um, thank you for, uh, for inviting us to participate today. Um, so a little context to, to address that question. I think um, I come at this question from a, uh, from a HHS perspective. Although when I interpret HHS, I like to think of it as human and health services, uh, as opposed to health and human services. Because I see as health as a actually subordinate to uh, human services in general. And that perspective is really informed in large part by, uh, I guess this term called social determinants of health. Is that a term people are aware of, familiar with? So in, in short, I'm not a public health professional, but the idea is pretty straightforward and some of the numbers are really compelling regarding the uh, actual outcomes, the health and well-being outcomes, are actually more attributable to the social services, behavioral health services, uh, environmental services than they are actual clinical health. And some of the work that's going on indicates that as, as much as 80% of a person's well-being and health outcomes are actually due to the non-healthcare pieces of the equation. So let me just say that again. Only 20% of the health of the health outcomes and the well-being outcomes is actually attributable to health care services as we know. It. So if we think about that, we heard a little bit about that today uh, about the investment, where all the money is going is on the health care side and not the human services side. And so I think that with that frame uh, in mind, it's really important to think about what we're doing and the role of open data. So uh, again, we heard a little bit earlier about uh, sort of the protected information that uh, large government agencies hold about uh, services that are provided to the clients and customers around. That information only describes a piece of the equation, right? So, and they recognize that they're treating whole people, but they only have a small slice of the information necessary, partially because the systems don't talk to one another, uh, and partially because the other information is just not available. And so I think that open data, uh, is really uh, sort of fills in the, uh, the puzzle, so to speak. So as we've heard about a lot today, 
you know, there's a lot of pieces that go into health. And whether or not uh, when someone gets released from hospital or an admission, they go back into the community, they might have had a $50,000 know, episode, uh, and now they're released back to their home, and guess what? They don't have any food. Uh, they can't get to the doctor because they don't have transportation. They have no home health care services. They have no family. The faith-based community is not available to them. So what happens? Really preventable kinds of things occur that end them back up in the hospital. It's very, very expensive. Uh, intervention. And so when I think about open data and some of the work we've been talking about doing and working with a number of states is to think about it as an overlay to the health and human services data. How can it provide the context to think about uh, and to provide solutions to the complex problems people bring today uh, to our systems? And then with both the open information as well as the protected information, we have a better shot at actually providing a holistic perspective. So I think that government agencies are just coming to this. I mean, they're overwhelmed with their own data and ability to get it. Now, no less with uh, a whole nother wave, a tsunami of information. But I think that there are folks out there who are really getting it and understand the importance of it. And so I think there's a lot of hope and a lot of desire to be able to use that to really effectively provide coordinated care, which is all the bugs. How do we do that? Yeah, I think purple binder was the example. Like that. I, absolutely, that was that was a great example. Uh, sorry, does so anyone want to add to that? No, I'm just give a thumbs up to the uh, the, purple <laughs> binder. <laughs> yes. uh, the next question I wanted to ask is, you know, so let's say now that the government has said, okay, we're going to open our data, and we we've done it. Right? We've opened our data. First of all, we have thousands of data sets, depending on how you count it. It's going to take a while to do that. Um, but but the data, say, let's assume that the data is out there. Um, how do we put it to use? You know, almost always there's successful examples of how to do this that includes some element of partnering with outside organizations. Uh, maybe Mark can, can allude to that since the name of your your, uh, your monthly newsletter is ISCC Catalyst. Yes. You know. So yeah, I think definitely um, calling the state's lead really in the state of Illinois under Governor Quinn um, has been a leader in putting data sets online. As you know, this data at Illinois.gov portal has really created a new structure to get data out there. And I think the role of our organization as an you know, intermediary is to really align partners, um, both public and private, on how you unlock the potential of that data. And so one of the ways in which we've been um, effective in doing that, and one of the things we've taken on is, is really the, the role of, of competitions. Um, frankly, so there have been two um, two competitions we've been involved with. One in 2012, after Metro Chicago, Illinois. A second one called the uh, Illinois Open Tech Challenge. And so, using sort of funding as a little bit of a carrot, um, what we've done is to try to create a forum where developers, entrepreneurs can sort of come together to um, with the communities to think about uh, the power of of the data, whether it's you know, transportation or health um, or crime, etc. So the um, Illinois Open Tech Challenge, just to, to give a little bit of background on that, this was a pilot initiative with four municipalities outside of the Chicago region. So it's Rockford, South Suburbs, Champaign, um, and Belleville. And what we wanted to do on the first level, and I should recognize Dan O'Neill, I know he's a little under summer, spoke earlier on um, Smart Chicago Collaborative, who's a great partner of ours, on that was to get municipalities just culturally putting data sets online. So we had microsites developed um, to have them put their municipal data there. And the second effort was really going on site to these communities, bringing the economic development partners, the universities, um, the entrepreneurial community, nonprofit community, and really having them talk about what's important to them. Because I think the data on its, on its own is really um, just half the battle. It's really getting the stakeholders in a room to understand what the potential is. So there was a lot of discussion around economic development um, needs for a particular community, and part of what um, the, the challenge was is to have developers create um, new and interesting innovative apps. Um, so again, inherently we want kind of economic development as an underpinning to this. Um, so I think we had a, we had about $75,000 on the table um, for the competition. And I do want to recognize um, the sponsors we had for that. I think it's also very telling that there is an appetite from the foundation and, and, uh, and public and private community to, um, to support. So we had um, uh, the Knight Foundation, Chicago Community Trust, Motorola Mobility Foundation, Google, and Comcast. So it's interesting when you have you know folks that are um, kind of interested in this in civic innovation and really putting money towards that. 
So, um, so anyway, so that's been one, I would say, effective way that we help to create more awareness and visibility and also just having an entrepreneurial community um, connected with, with, with data and I think um, maybe making connections that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, and we can talk a little about some of the, um, some of the winners of that that have been helpful. So, so you see a big impact uh, economic development wise to making the government data available. And, is it, does it tie into the Innovation Council that the government is kind of creating? I know that your organization also set up. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we should be measured in that open data in and of itself is not sort of the the silver bullet to economic development um, for sure. I think what I what I sort of suggesting is that there could be um, new and interesting applications that create efficiencies in government that um, help align some partners in a way that hasn't happened before. And then yes, if there are new you know business models that emerge from the data, that's you know all all the better. Um, so I think we can't always just measure ourselves into economic output. But yeah, the Governor's Innovation Council, um, the Open Tech Challenge was was a great initiative of that. I know there's been a lot of um, support for the the data's platform, which I'm going to be talking a little bit more about, and how we just create more of a um, awareness, not just for the Chicago region, but really every municipality, the cultural shift of sort of putting uh, putting data online and using using it a little bit more effectively than we have currently. The next question is, uh, you know, lately it seems like there's an increase in organizations making significant investments uh, like these app challenges and others to encourage the use of these open data uh, sets and, and open health data sets. So, um, foundations are giving innovation grants for partnerships and pilot programs uh, in, in, in other ways as well. Um, why are foundations and, and other groups so interested in these endeavors? I mean, maybe Dominique, you can speak to this as our foundation right here. So, I'm not sure if you can explain some of that. Sure. So, um, first, I'll give you a little background on the Kauffman Foundation. Uh, Quinn, I just know about uh, the Kauffman Foundation. Okay. So, I'll give you a little background. So, the Kauffman Foundation is the uh, largest private foundation focused on uh, entrepreneurship and education. We have about a $2 billion endowment that we uh, use to do our activities, uh, fund our activities. Um, I personally happen to be uh, focusing on mostly healthcare and life sciences. And uh, my activities try to focus on catalyzing activities in areas where there's not much happening or not enough happening. Um, I'll give you a very uh, concrete example um, to help you understand a little bit better what we do, what we care, what we care about. So in the context of healthcare, and because of I'm, I'm, you know, we're present or the interest of entrepreneurs, um, there's three big things that they struggle with today. The first one is access. So once uh, entrepreneurs graduate from the, uh, the incubators, accelerators across the country, uh, they have some really exciting prototypes. They're going to change the world. But the big obstacle they face is how do I, how do I engage with uh, the centers of care? The, the second obstacle they face is when they, they sort of fall in love. Uh, with their potential collaborators, how do you deal with the collaboration issues around um, intellectual property, data ownership rights, data standards, etc.? So how do you walk, walk, walk through that? And so we're actually working on a, a coding white paper that just talks about a uh, playbook about um, collaborations that talks about these different issues. And the final is that you know when you come out and you have a successful collaboration, meaning you show some outcome, some cost saving at, the, at some level, sometimes it simply is not enough um, for for these practices to be adopted. And really, the evidence is what's lacking from a data perspective is cost data. And so that's something also where I'm, I'm uh, thinking about. And so uh, i give you a very specific example of how we're tackling this um, uh, as a foundation. We're actually in partnership with the Health Data Consortium. We're doing a series of events across the country, four cities next year, um, uh, Boston, Pittsburgh, Houston, and uh, Kansas City, where we're, we're uh, working with local partners local uh, community leaders. So these are care centers, these are large employers, these are um, um, uh, employers, care support, and payers. Um, and we're recruiting a talent, a, a full of talented entrepreneurs that are uh, potentially could help answer some of the big unmet needs that, that local partners have expressed as being areas of interest. And so that's kind of a, a, and one area that we can bring people together, help generate the data, the evidence needed that these kinds of approaches are actually beneficial and are uh, resulting in better outcomes and lower costs of care. Um, so once the data is in an open platform uh, and these creative partnerships have been formed, uh, it's obvious that the data has a better chance to be put to good use. Uh, but what does that mean? What does good use of the data actually mean? Often, our government agencies uh, embark on these initiatives to open up our data in order to solve issues that historically 
uh, we can challenge to achieve on our own. For example, government tends to be uh, challenged with direct engagement uh, with some of the populations we're trying to serve. Uh, and then also being able to uh, relate to that average resident. Sometimes we talk to government talk too often. Uh, sometimes we put the data out there in a way that only another government person would be able to understand it. Uh, so, so Matt, maybe from the private sector perspective, you can uh, kind of talk about the direct individual consumer engagement and how it's uh, more likely to achieve using government data, um, but from the fire perspective. Sure. I mean, I think that uh, I'm sure you all are very, very busy in the government. You get lots of questions. Think about the fact that at Bing, we answered three and a half billion queries a month, right? A significant portion of them are about health, right? People are more likely to come ask us about health than they are their own doctors at the beginning. You walk into a doctor's office and he says, oh, you have so-and-so. You don't want to look stupid. By asking them a bunch of questions, people are very uncomfortable with that, right? Everybody hates talking to the mechanic because they're like, I don't know, makes the kachunga chunga noise, <laughs> right? You feel dumb, so you want to go find out what you don't know first. So what's the first thing people do when they find out that they have a health condition? They go search, right? We are the person having that frontline conversation on your behalf. So I think it seems to have pointed out, if you're not making data available, to us in a way that we can educate people at that first moment of contact, that's a huge opportunity lost. And it's not because we don't want to help them. Right? We're there. We want to answer that question. And we talk about all these great you know, public private partnerships, these apps that we created. How do you think people find those apps? They search for them. Right? We are the person who says, oh, you said you have diabetes. Let me give you a a high-level overview of diabetes, and here are the diabetes-related apps that I've got available in the Windows 8 or Windows Phone Store. Right? Here's what's available. Right? So if you don't give us at least semi-structured information that we can put into an entity model so that when, hey, when they say diabetes, we say, yeah, we know I have diabetes as an entity. We understand what all pieces mean. That's the frontline contact that we need. And I think uh, I love uh, your presentation, particularly because it was incredibly user friendly. But we're going to be way better at that than most everybody in this room. Right? We've got a whole amazing staffs that are doing amazing UI work to make sure that data is easy for people to understand. Let us do our jobs. And do the job you're really, really, really good at. I mean, someone was uh, sort of chatting with me during the break about how many PhDs were in this room. Right? There's a tremendous amount of really, really deep, deep, deep insight here. Be good at the deep, deep. Let us do the 10,000 view. That's the partnership we need. Um, you know, as a follow-up, I was just wondering, you know, how can this lead to changing the behavior of those individuals who are doing these searches? You know, sure. How does that kind of I know you're a behavioral scientist. I am. I have, and, and we had a, you know, this. So Crown and Jeff was talking a bit about the New York Health data. We had the opportunity to sort of host the first hackathon ever on the sort of New York Health API. It was a fascinating weekend, right? Uh, and so they showed, uh, lots and lots of folks who were hacking sort of came to me and like, all right, all right, we want to change data. How do you do it? So, so uh, I think someone earlier actually sort of tangentially suggested it, which is that behavior is really about promoting pressures, reasons to do something, and inhibiting pressures, how hard it is to do, right? In Bing, we're on the inhibiting pressure side. How can I make it easier for you to do this thing? Right? I never encourage people to make a query. Right? People come already equipped with that promoting pressure. And so I think that uh, where we are working purely on the inhibition point, how we make things easier, I think there's a lot of opportunities for, this people, for the people in this room to think about how is it they get people to ask the question in the first place. I mean, and that goes back to you know sort of the wonderful data visualizations. You know, how do you get people to think about like, ah, yes, education, health, you know, being connected to people in my communities. These are things I should be thinking about. The event will come to us and ask the question, and we can then direct them back to you to the more deep level stuff that allows you to do the very specific behavior. Ah, so if we walk through this like, you know, at a global level. She says, think about, you know your activity level, global health. They come to us, they say, what can I do to increase my activity level? We say, 
Biking, and let me tell you about this great biking app that the city of San Diego has produced. And we send them back. So it's this big cycle of how do we push back and forth between getting people interested in the first place, directing them to the thing that's going to let them do it, and then handing them back to you in the best possible place. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question and open it up for a QA. Uh, this is really for anybody on the panel, so feel free to uh, uh, chime in here. Um, as a state agency, uh, and, and sometimes um, in government in general, it, it tends to be that we get very comfortable working with the same traditional partners. Right? We know who our stakeholder group is, we have a preconceived notion of who the parties are that we should be working with, or the only ones that are interested in, in our data, uh, for instance. Um, but I know that as part of our strategic plan, our director set for us, uh, he made a commitment to reaching out to uh, create more partnerships uh, beyond just those traditional. So improving the ones we have that are traditional and then reaching out to other non-traditional partners. Can you talk about, um, or can somebody speak about some of the best ways to engage with, to seek, to find out who those non-traditional partners are, somebody that you never thought of before that can all of a sudden help you solve some of your problems? Not easy question, but yeah, I mean, just to start, I mean, I think it, it comes down to where there's aligned vision and shared vision. So just you know, getting back to the competition um, that we ran, we you know we were doing evergreen work. So a lot of communities, we were bringing together um, groups that maybe knew each other, but perhaps they didn't have a forum where they could talk about um, maybe shared problems they were having. So as you know, in the south suburbs, for instance, um, economic development um, was a huge issue there. Just uh, business retention, attracting new businesses. So there were a lot of different pockets of communities that were doing great work on their own in terms of you know GIS mapping and, and really um, understanding what their assets were. But I think the the forum for them to get to get together realized that they had kind of a way to align their mission in terms of site selection. So it was a kind of a site selection tool and app that was created. So I think when a starting point for me is when you find kind of not traditional partners, it it comes down to where that common ground is among. Um, you know, aligned vision, particularly in the time of, of sort of dwindling resources potentially, where you have maybe nonprofit providers or economic development or workforce development groups, um, you know, engaging with universities in a way that, uh, or develop the community in a way that they have before. So I think that's maybe a starting point. I think what really is very powerful is to have an ask. So, um, so part of this project I mentioned to you, I was uh, talking to folks in Houston, and their the community was saying, we're really, really interested in solving the problem of obesity. And we would love to see some really cool tools to deal with behavior changes, to deliver information very more effectively, and et cetera, et cetera. So that right away triggered a lot of ideas about what you should tell them. So it was sort of, sort of, in a very short amount of time, uh, a short list of people that may be interested in helping providing the solution. So these are potentially you know, other agencies. This could be other uh, industry partners, uh, foundations. Entrepreneurs, etc. So that's I think is the most useful. Just having you get a very specific ask, and you can get the people around you. I think there's a, a, a starting place here. Well, I think it's great to include and to involve other stakeholders in the, in the conversation. Uh, our experience over the years has been, uh, oddly enough, having uh, creating helping to create forums within side existing government structures for them to one meet each other. Secondly, to actually talk with one another, and thirdly, to get creative about how they can do more together within the agency that they live in. And unfortunately, oftentimes our agencies uh, are so structured in such silos that there's a and people are so busy uh, that there's really not a lot of focus on sh crossing those those silos. And that uh, we found just tremendous interest uh, everywhere we have. The opportunity to work is to actually introduce people in a different kind of forum and a different kind of conversation so they can actually hear about uh, how they're addressing the, the clients that they're actually already servicing. You know, uh, I think Herb said it was up to 60% of the state budget is going towards health and human services and corrections and those kinds of things. There's nobody bigger out there that's spending money on that. The people who are actually having to create solutions and figure out how to get that conversation going need help within their organizations to have that conversation. And then they may have a little bit more uh, bandwidth to hear and bring in other people outside who will say, why don't you guys talk better to one another? We've already given you the information. You've already got my birth certificate. In fact, you've got my birth certificate five times already. Can't you talk to the guy next door and get it from him? 
It's a little cynical, but it's uh, starting at the, at the uh, generation uh, trying to burst at the end. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that uh, one part of this is we sometimes get in this place where we're where we're we privilege talking to an unusual partner just because they're an unusual partner. You know, I think Dominique said it well when he sort of said, like, you have to have X. Like, there's a reason that you're talking to an unusual partner. And going back to sort of, you know, a, a, a behavioral framework, right? Either you want them to drive interest on your behalf. I'm the city of San Diego. I am trying to get people to pay attention to health. I'm going to go to the local hip hop collaborative and figure out how we can collaborate so that we can take their community to get them interested in my thing. Or you need to be able to do something and you're trying to remove a blocker. So you're going to another agency and you say, I need this data, right? You're going to Bing and you're saying, hey, look, I, I really need to be able to like access the, the index in a particular way. So I think you want to know it's not just unusual for the sake of unusual, right? And too often we get very, very excited about a partnership because it's the partnership itself is interesting without really thinking about what is the outcome of this partnership that I'm actually trying to get. Right? It is no good to go talk to the hip hop collaborative if you haven't sort of said, and the whole point of this is that these people that they are talking to are listening to this hip hop are now going to pay attention to health in a way that they haven't previously done. Um, why don't we open it up for a couple of uh, questions from the audience? Mike Runners? And no softball questions, man. Some of these questions have really been too nice. I want to hear some hard questions. I think I have one for you. Uh. <laughs> All of you guys are giving me a little hard for you. Um, I, I'm the director, senior director of government relations for the American Heart Association. So, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, you know, when I speak about difficulties with government, I also want to speak about the pleasure that it is to work with the Illinois Department of Public Health. Uh, you know, an agency, you know, I, I think your tagline should be something like an agency that actually cares. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, but I represent, I think, a, sort of a whole low tech group of entrepreneurs um, who's really frustrated with some of the conversation that goes on because. Almost nobody, I think we've talked about social determinants and we've talked about all these other things. All the conversation here has been about how can we use data to analyze it, to tell, essentially, to tell people what they should do to be healthy. And again, okay, I, you know, I accept that and I hope that everybody will accept that characterization, although certainly not that simplistic. What I think a lot of us are frustrated with is why is it that nobody really talks about how to use data to help the consumer tell the government what to do? Um, let me give you a great example. Somebody bings a disease. Does one of the things that come up is the fact that sequestration has cut biomedical research by X amount. And here's what you can do to email your so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think a lot of us are very frustrated because when I go lobby, one of the things that I like about being with the American Heart Association is that we're precluded by our own bylaws from taking most government money. So once I walk into a legislator's office and they realize that I don't want money from them, they're much more likely to actually listen to what we have to say. But a lot of times, we work really, really hard to get the you know, a couple of hundred people in Illinois to take action on an action alert we sent them. Whereas if we were working with some of you, that could be thousands or hundreds of thousands because these are all consumers who are interested in the issue. So I, I will stop at this point, but I really challenge you to close the loop because the loop remains open right now because consumers are not empowered to change the game. You're just helping them play the game right. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I know that has been an area that we've talked about in, in great length today. But um, I can tell you that, and, and I know Dr. Hadwick mentioned it in his earlier remarks, and so did uh, uh, Brian said it. Uh, they alluded to the fact that um, 
And even Crystal Thomas mentioned part of the reason why the governor has pursued open uh, data uh, through, through platforms like Socrata uh, is that part of it is, is being very open and honest about you know, the data you have. And some of that is performance data right, uh, of how your organization is uh, performing. And so um, you know, we are a very large regulator in the state, you know, IEPH. And um, you know, one of the things we've looked at is that we get significant FOIA requests for some of this data on regulated facilities and entities. And um, one of the things we want to do is reduce our FOIA request, the administrative burden, um, by releasing that data. Now, what's the net benefit of that is also includes the fact that now the, the public has an ability to hold us accountable for either not appropriately following up on complaints in these facilities, wherever it may be, because they have the, the data, or, or also the, the public has the ability to hold those facilities accountable themselves. You know, there's, there's a number of apps through municipal level that's been uh, developed uh, nationwide, originating in San Francisco uh, with the, the city Department of Public Health, where they partnered with Yelp, who Code for America in the first year, and uh, took all their restaurant inspection data, and put a button right on the Yelp page of that restaurant with their score, and I think in, in some municipalities you can even click on a PDF and see the actual report. A lot better way of getting that in the hands of somebody before they make a decision to go eat there. Um, so they can, you know, choose to, to no longer go eat there at the restaurant. Um, and if, and I think there's actually been some cases where municipalities have released that data and they've been criticized for not visiting facilities frequently enough if, if a report is too outdated. So, so there is some accountability and transparency in there for government when they start to release this data, especially when it comes to our performance metrics, which you know, our entire budget process is going to. So. so uh, Really quick tutorial on how search engines work, right? Uh, somebody searches for something, diabetes, and they click on the first link, and then we see them come back, and then they click on the second link, and then that's it. So we go, oh, the second link is probably better than the first link, right? That's how linking works, right? You look at the pop. So we, it is a very two way big data problem where people are actually signaling popularity to us, right? So I think you're absolutely right that there is a big data problem that is about tracking what people actually want from you. Oregon did a, uh, an amazing thing uh, that some of you may be familiar with when they were sort of figuring out OMAP, sort of Oregon Health Insurance, but they actually wrote to everybody in the state and said, okay, we can cover, here are the things we could cover, which ones do you want us to cover? Right? That wasn't the only determinant, but it was a factor. Right? People were, you know, because we might have looked at the big data and said, oh, Cancer happens the most, so we're going to cover cancer, right? But it turned out, you know, people were really concerned about, you know, health or, or sort of diabetes, right? And so we're going to move that up the rank. So I think there can be this this two-way portion of uh, back and forth. And you're right, right to call us out. I don't think we've done a good enough job today talking about how people actually push data in. That said, we already have all this data sitting around. Right? Whereas what you're really talking about is new sets of data that we don't generally track. And that's, I think, a, an important follow-up conversation is, what are the things that we're not tracking that we should be tracking? Right? So much of this is about taking the covers off data we already have and making it available so that Mark, when he does like a great social innovation competition, has the available data. But it is absolutely true that one of the questions you should walk out of here saying is, what's the question we're not asking? I mean, Mark, maybe you can speak to sort of in the competition if people sort of thought about this or. Um, well, I guess I don't know, I'd like to highlight one of the winners actually that really kind of made me convey. So, um, OK, Kobe, I don't know if Greg's in the room, but they were going to send someone um, today. So, they're to me one of the best examples of the conversation, a little bit of a company that sort of was able to be formed out of, out of data. So, they won the um, Astromed Chicago competition a few uh, years ago, and essentially they created a database of the providers. And uh, and costs for medical procedures. So in essence, uh, from data perspective, you know they looked at it as you shop for um, flights or hotels, and you're able to get all this information about cost, but you aren't able to do the same thing for health procedures. Um, and so they kind of uncovered this mountain of data to help people find out how much things cost. I'm going to get the inventory and pulled it up yesterday. So now they have essentially um, saved over 35,000 users. More than three million in healthcare prices, um, and again, unearthing data that was previously hidden 
to um, to consumers, those particularly that are uninsured or that you know where the gaps are in terms of um, you know, Medicare and Medicaid. So this is again to your point. I mean, it is sort of empowering consumers to to think about the marketplace, et cetera. And so I think this is one maybe illustrative example of how um, you know there is efforts when you kind of convene and, and then even having kind of showcasing the ability for entrepreneurs to think about these problems to create kind of businesses out of that. So um, anyway, so I, that, that's just to me a great example of, of how competition can serve in that, in that role. And OK, COVID really is a great example. Please you know, check them out if you haven't. If I could just also add one, one last piece uh, to my earlier comments. Um, and just real quickly, uh, so sometimes too, the, the data that we have that we're trying to uh, put out in an open format in a more usable, more digested way, um, is that missing element or the key element where somebody's already working to tell the government what they need to change. And sometimes they need that other piece of information to now take it, add it to their assessment, and then you know complete uh, their assessment and tell us what we need to do uh, differently. As well. And I'm pretty sure the guy over at Purple Binder right over there wants to tell you what people are looking for. Right? Like that was in his talk was, and we will identify the gaps that are, exist in the community based on what people are asking. Yeah, from a wonder guy. <laughs> <laughs> we have one the, I think we have one more time for one last question. Right here in the center. The DC government released uh, much of their internal data in 2006, and they found out that the majority of the users were actually different departments. So you might have housing data in six departments. And, you know, in the state of Illinois, we have this budgeting for results, which I think is supposed to be the first year. And the idea is to examine many government services are actually carried out by private organizations, nonprofits. I mean, you have a foreclosure counseling service that counsels 200 people a year and costs $2,000 per person. You have another one in another part of the state that counsels 800 people a year for you know, a quarter of the cost, like that. And we have a, a, a group that counsels people getting out of prison. You know, another, and you, you try to figure out which ones are getting the most effective results, and then you share those results. And so the first component, I think, is that your internal data is supposed to be looking at the, this data to try to figure out what's efficient, what's not, reallocate money. But then you're going to release data so that the public can be like, software developer and designers can start analyzing it. Can you give us an update on the progress of that program that's happening? Of the budget for results? Yeah. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned just briefly, uh, you're absolutely right. We are, as a state, working towards, I think we're in our second year or so, of working towards budgeting based upon uh, performance metrics within every agency. And we've had a budget for, you know, for a long time where we have certain metrics in there. They're really refining all those and then hopefully moving within this next budget cycle actually to making decisions on funding based upon past performance. Uh, also often agencies, you know, my first experience in state government was a CFO and uh, our budget started with, what was it last year? You know, we began from there and tried to justify for that and forbid if we saved any money that year, you know, we, we tried to spend it quickly at the end of the year because then next year if we needed it, um, they were going to cut it if we didn't spend it the previous year. <laughs> So, so it became this, uh, you know, this vicious cycle. Well, now they're moving, and some of it was that we were just mandated to do it. Was it getting the results the, the original legislation intended? You know, it, it wasn't really being evaluated. We were just continually funding it uh, for that purpose. And the ones that were achieving outstanding results, um, they weren't necessarily growing in funding or being continued to, to, to get more funding because these other mandates were, were there uh, crowding up the budget. So they definitely are uh, moving in that direction. This year, we, we are. Uh, being forced as all state agencies, which is a good thing, um, to, to get information into a public dashboard uh, for a budgeting process. So, being told we're out of time, um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you to our panelists.